What's up, guys? It is Rick Ginn, and today we are talking all about what not to say to your sellers. Honestly, I've spent so much time telling you guys what to say to the sellers, and sometimes the best way to learn is figure out what you can't say, and once you know what you can't say, then it's kind of easy from there. So if you guys don't know me, my name is Rick Ginn. I've been doing wholesaling for 20 years plus. And I, I, I really enjoy doing this. So um, some of you guys know me through my son, Zach Ginn, and you've joined us on our journey and we collaborate. And specifically, you are on the Rick Ginn channel. So if you guys are new to this channel, just do me a favor, make sure you are subscribed. And on the right hand side, you can use the comment section. And if you got a question about wholesaling, go ahead and put it in there. And also, as I see you guys are taking advantage, we do the one-on-one -on -one mastermind, which boy, you guys find it fast today, which is awesome. So I try to take everybody in order. They put it in there. And if you have a question pertaining to wholesaling, heck, you can even have a question in regards to me. I will ask it. I do not require your video to be on there. Just get out there because if you have the question, there's probably hundreds, if not thousands of other people have the same question and we want to help you out as much as possible. So make sure you use the comment section, introduce yourself. Let us know which market you're in. Let us know if you're a new wholesaler, you're just getting started and you can actually find some really cool people within these chats. You guys do it all the time. You guys are doing JVs on the side, all sorts of deals. And at this channel, we show you how to do wholesaling without paying any type of money. I know it's a shocking revelation. The gurus are not happy about it and they want to kill this channel at all costs. I don't care. I've been doing this longer than most of them all put together. Ah, so somebody says, I can't hear you. So someone let me know if they got a thumbs up on the um, audio testing. It says my audio is working. So um, it looks like it's working. So if you got a question, put it in the comments. Someone give me a thumbs up that the audio is working before I have to pull my phone out here and verify, which I'm going to do anyways. And let's get started, man. We're going to talk about all what not to say in wholesaling today let's see here let's see if it's working testing testing yeah it's working it's got to be your computer so i appreciate you guys so um there is a link in the top of the stream if you want to click that that will get you on the mastermind or you can go through my um, youtube group and you can connect there or wholesaling houses for real so let's get into it without further ado we're talking about what not to say to sellers because honestly, a lot of times when you say the wrong thing, it can absolutely kill your deal and it can be over before it even started. So I decided, hey, let's just simplify it. I'm going to go over what not to say. Now, I can't go everything you're going to say. If you want to learn exactly what to say, how to say it, and the right way to say it, do me a favor. Um, you can simply go over to freewholesaling.com. I'll put it on your screen here. That is a course that me and my son have created. And here's the really cool port. You want to know what the fee is to get into it? It's your email address. That's it. I never charge you a fee. The really cool thing is if you subscribed to how me and Zach teach wholesaling, number one, you'll never pay. You're going to pay with your time and you're going to pay with your enthusiasm and you're going to pay it forward to someone else to help them get along just like when you got started. And that's what we're going to do. And by doing that, I create a legacy to prove you guys that the gurus think everything's pay for play. And most gurus don't have a, a ton of knowledge about wholesaling. And there is a huge population of gurus that know very little about wholesaling, but man, are their fees huge. And you know why I know? Because you guys comment on them all the time. And they've been around forever. Guys, this is... 2023 it is not 2003 anymore the way you learn in wholesaling is actually completely different and if you're not on this wave join us at freewholesaling.com we'll show you how to get everything going so let's jump into it as i said make sure you are subscribed to this channel this is the rick in channel because on my channel i re release exclusive videos that I don't release on Flip with Rick and I don't do it on my son's channel. Why? Because some of you guys like hearing from the old guy and 
so we can segment some of our information. So if you like working with me a little bit better, that's great. If you want to jump over to the younger side of my son, you can go over to zachginn.com. Same thing. They just do it on the younger man's version. And honestly, if you love what you see today, just make sure you smash that like button. So let's get into it because I want to help you guys out as much as I can. So <clears throat> what? So you have to remember this key function. It's what not to say. That is going to be the secret here. I don't know why everything's popping up in purple. I'm just going to change the color codes. Anyways, so let's jump into it. <laughs> It's just going to be an interesting one. Um, so what not to say to your seller? So the the key term, and I, I kind of do this what I feel like the order of importance. So if I only had one thing to teach you, it would be like this top line is, ready? Don't ask a seller what. It is, there is a huge difference. So if you're asking what, let me give you an example. Hey, Mr. Seller, what do you want for your house? How much are you asking for your house? These are all implied words that are used in the realtor world, and they have no business in the wholesaling world at all. If you start using words like this, you're going to get answers you do not want. Why? Because you're evoking a, a preset condition, a subconscious answer with it. So let me give it. So we are looking for people that don't want to sell their house. Actually, let me fix this. I'm going to get more specific. It's still the same thing, but I kind of like to be more specific with you guys. So when you talk about a want, you've got to understand a want is a want. I want a lot of things. You guys want a lot of things we all want. If you ask a seller what they want, you're going to get a wish list 100% of the time. So when it comes to wholesaling, it's you have to be very careful what you ask for. So if you ask a seller what they want for the house, you're going to get a wish list price. How much are you asking for the house? Wish list price. So how do we turn that around to our advantage? Number one, stop saying it. Do not use the word want. We are going to replace the word want and request what the seller needs, okay? We are only buying properties where they have a high motivation to sell. They need to sell. They don't want to sell. You see, people who want to sell, go see a realtor. Go see my realtors. They'll take great care of you. And to be honest with you, you want to avoid those people like the plague because they're the ones that will drive you nuts, waste your time, never make a decision, ghost you and will burn you out of wholesaling. So if you understand that when it comes time to ask questions, instead of saying, hey, Mr. Seller, what do you want for this house? Hey, Mr. Seller, what do you need to get out of this house? That it's complete brain switch. So both are subconscious, like, but we're looking for their subconscious bottom line price. If you ask them what they want, you're going to get their subconscious highest price. So we want to be here. And if you stop using the word want, you can now find out what they need because we all know what people want. They want everything. So they're all going to want a million bucks for the house. So ask them what they need. So what do you need to get away to walk away from this house, from this end of story, replace the word want with need. And if you're not asking like that, you have the wrong seller. I'm telling you, if you just take that rule, it will change how you do wholesaling. So many of you guys are trying to fit a square peg in a round hole. It doesn't work that way. If the motivation's not there, do not waste your time. Asking questions like, what do you need for your house? Is something a realtor is. What should we ask for your house? Well, I think it's worth 500,000, but I, asked, I, I like to ask five, 595,000. Well, let's see if someone will pay for it. It's not going to be us. So you've got to understand that. So want to need Guys, it is everything. I hear so many of you guys saying, what do you, what do you want for your house? No, Mr. Seller, what do you need to get? And just, and when they say that, go, listen, like what's, what's the number that, that gets this done for you? And when you say that, it is completely different on how you are responding to them. So the next thing is lying to sellers, man. You guys got to stop doing this. I, so many gurus out there teach you 
just fake it till you make it. It, it doesn't work that way. If you fake it till you make it, it means you never knew what you were doing in the first place. So you're only faking yourself out. So number one, when you get a question and you don't know the answer, you got a choice. You can either lie to your seller. And when you lie, you better write down your lie and put it in your CRM. Because once you start lying, it is a rabbit hole. You will keep spiraling down until you get caught. How are you going to get caught? There's no way to track your lies. So the easiest way to avoid lying is don't do it, number one. So if you don't know an answer, just say, listen, that is a great question, Mr. Seller. I have somebody on my team that I know they know the answer, and I'm going to see them later this afternoon. Do you mind if I run that by them? And do you mind if I come back at five and then we can go over it with you? Or can I call you at five? Just don't lie to them. If you don't lie to them, you never have to worry about it and you don't get all stressed out. So many of you guys are running around like you are an absolute expert in real estate. It's okay in the beginning. I didn't know anything. I still don't know everything. When I don't know the answer, I just say, listen, I don't sit there and hang on it that I don't know. I said, that is a great question. And you know what? I want to get an expert to answer that. I have somebody on my team. Can I get back to you in a couple hours and give you the correct answer? Number one, they'll respect you. Number two, it's going to make them feel more at ease for you. And number three, you don't have to lie about it. I'm just telling you, if you would just take this little, stop lying to people. It sucks. Nobody can keep up with your lies. It's, it's complete hogwash. So let's go over trigger words because we're talking about what not to say to sellers. And guys, this is 21 years of experience. This is a big one right off the bat. And most of you are making this a mistake right now. You ready? Stop telling people you're a wholesaler and investor. I know it's what you did. Well, Rick, I'm lying. You're not lying. The problem is you do not want to be stereotyped. Do you know that most realtors, when you use the word wholesaler, it is a negative con connotation. They look at you like a used car salesman. It's the truth, guys. I'm a wholesaler. I have to deal with this all the time. Matter of fact, when I go to buy properties in the commercial arena, I am attacked as a wholesaler because I'm all over the net as a wholesaler and I can't really hide it. And I have properties that I'm paying cash for or traditional financing for millions of dollars, and they hold it over my head as a wholesaler. And honestly, it's a pain in the butt. So understanding, do not introduce yourself to the seller as a wholesaler investor. Well, Rick, what do I call myself? You're simply a cash buyer looking to buy a property in this neighborhood. I want to see if your home qualifies. That's it. Once you say wholesaler, they're like, uh-oh, here comes an aggressive used car salesman shark guy coming at me or gal. And then investor kind of has the same, like they've going to, it sounds like they have to make a killing off me to buy my house. So we want to avoid any type of preconceptions or anything like that. The best way you can do is avoid the word wholesaler and investor. Are you lying? No, you're not. But the problem is it's so stereotyped. People will label you. It's like saying, um, you know, if you say you're like, you're uh, you know, you're, you're a football player, like, oh, you know, you're one of those aggressive, crazy types of people. No, they, they just have a very high skill set, And so, um, so instead of someone saying, Hey, am I a football player? They said, Hey, I'm an athlete. So there's always a way around it when you want to do it and kind of go from there. Now here's the next one. You ready for this house and home? So you guys can go in the comments. Let me know. What do you think the difference between a house and a home is? It's, um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm reading why I do this. So a house is a house. A house is an implication of where a family typically lives. It's very personalized. A home is not necessarily a house, a property or anything. A home is really kind of the old saying is like where your heart is. That's where you put your, your head down at night and you feel comfortable and safe. Some people's home could be out on the street. It's just the truth. So home, so let me put it on there. Home is definitely an emotional attachment and there's a time and a place to use the word home. It is not right out the gate. So when we're first talking to a seller, we want to detach them a little bit from their emotional connection, especially if it's good and positive. So realtors have to go through this all the time. And so you have to switch and replace the words. So home is a state of mind, it is a location in your head, it is a safe place. 
And when you people think they're going to take their safe place away, it causes them to rest, even on a crappy house. So replace the word house and home with simply property. It's just property is very cold. It's like it's like owning a piece of paper. So the word home is like, hey, are you going to buy my home? You have to be very careful because a home is not necessarily a house or a piece of property. It's where people feel safe. And remember, if you're buying their house and they have to relocate, they're going to feel vulnerable and they're not going to feel as safe. And so you have to constantly reassure them. So now I will go to house and home to do the final close for an emotional, but I'm always going to try to use it in their forward progressive place they're going. So if they're going to live with their mom in Utah, I say, listen, don't you want to be home in the house with your mom in Utah? Like, oh yeah, that would be great, Rick. So understand know how to use it. So in the beginning, um, we're looking to buy properties in the area. We're not looking to buy houses and homes. Now, this is a big one, guys. And you got to understand this is <clears throat> so many of you guys carry around. That's a bad example. This is my iPad type of deal. You guys carry around folders when you walk into these appointments. Get rid of them. You should have nothing more than a pen in your pocket and maybe your cell phone and make sure you put it on vibrate and nothing else. Why? Because... It is human nature when you walk in with a bunch of paperwork and you're like little manila folders like I used to, and you have contracts sticking out, your seller will start to gravitate and wait for you to reach for it because they think the answer is in there and you do not get as much attention from them. So the best thing to do is leave it in your car. Go in, take a look at the house, build rapport, take a look, looks around. Remember, you can always come back, take pictures, take notes. But if you do not connect with them, build a rapport and turn it into a conversation, you don't have to worry about keeping notes, taking pictures, because you're not going to get a good deal. So there's something less intimidating when somebody walks in without paperwork. My favorite thing is when a realtor or another investor walks on a property, I have multiple bids going on. All I do is focus on the homeowner. That's all I do. I do not focus on the price. I do not focus on my competition. I focus and clearly listen to what the homeowner needs, and I make sure I address it. And we're going to get to the other parties that show up to uh, these multiple bids because I got a way to deal with it. The other one is just the word contract. I don't know what it is, but this word just makes people tighten up. They freak out when they hear the word contract. They think of finality. They think that they're going to make a big financial mistake. So just replacing words, my favorite word to replace it with is just simple, the word agreement. Nobody's ever going to fight you on agreement. You can use autograph. Um, signature is kind of the same word. Um, so agreement will replace the words like contract and signature. No problem. So now filler words, the, these, this is killer in wholesaling. A lot of times when you're with a seller and you think it's going the way you need to, they're telling, giving you all the signs you get to the end of your negotiation and you throw out and you make, you make some sort of offer. So hopefully you're countering because you went and go for no, but there's this awkward silence. Instead of you letting 20, 30, or 50 seconds or even a minute go by, you use what we call filler words. I was brutally guilty of this in my first year, probably to my second year, is I couldn't stand the awkward silence. I felt like I was going to get kicked out of the house, so I would talk over in those gaps, and it would give the seller more and more time to think and try to come up with a, the best answer they could do. And the problem is, the longer you give them time to think about it, the more crap you're going to get. So when you use filler words because it's awkward, you're working against yourself. The reason you use those filler words is because you feel uncomfortable. And it feels like you could cut the tension with a knife. And I get it. But using the words like just constantly... So most filler words that you keep going over the contract over and over and all the things you're going to do for them, you just sometimes have to let people make a decision or let them come up with a counter to get a deal. This is the part of the works of a negotiation that you cannot talk through. And it's painful and it's hard to learn and you actually have to practice this skill. So when you make a pitch or an offer and it goes awkward silence, stay there. I don't know why. But what it does is it makes their brain work so much more powerful to come out with an answer. And honestly, you might not even get the answer you want, but you'll get finality to where it's going. So 
the more time you give them by putting in filler words, the more crap you're going to get back. So I want the raw emotional response when I get down to the numbers and filler words. If you guys do it, it's going to kill you. You are better off as a newbie wholesaler just to shut your mouth and let them speak the words. So always think of negotiations as a volleyball match. When you serve the ball over, you can't talk until they tell you a response. And if you try to talk because they're taking time to forge their thoughts, you are killing your own negotiations deals. Guys, don't be the word filler. I was literally a walking poster child my first year of this. I still did very good, but I talked myself probably out of a dozen deals because I, it was me who was uncomfortable. The seller wasn't. They were just trying to make a lifetime decision. And if you understand it's going to be the biggest decision of their life, give them the time to make it. Now, sometimes they have to sleep on it and stuff like that. But for the most part, when they're there and they need time, they're trying to process in their brain. You talking only makes it 10 times worse. So let the silence go by. It sometimes feels like it's an hour. I don't know how to describe this. And that's why we get wildly uncomfortable. Remember, they're not your family. They're people you're trying to help out. And remember, you're never going to force them to do a deal with you. They're going to come to their own conclusion eventually. And hopefully it's with you, me, us, whoever it is. But please don't talk yourself out of by using the filler word. So now, so many of you guys are guilty of asking questions which you wildly don't know the answer for. Now, when you're building rapport with sellers, here's a little trick, especially if you guys are new to it and uncomfortable with it. To make the conversation flow better and more comfortable, ask questions you already know the answers to. Guys, I could do like an entire marriage live stream on this topic alone. You know exactly what I'm talking about. If you ask the question, you know the answer to, well, Rick, how am I going to know that? As I'm walking into the car, if I'm walking in, I see somebody has a Trump sticker or a Biden sticker in their car. There's a question, you know the answer to. When you see a picture on a bunch of kids, you see the same kids over and over, the same people in there. There's a question on the answer. Do you have kids? You know they're going to say yes. It could be grandkids. It could be anything. But once you do that, they know you're paying attention and they, they love, everybody loves to talk about themselves and their family. So a key thing is instead of asking such cold questions and you're getting hard no's, start to ask questions you know the answer to and get them to flow and get the conversation going from that. Do you like sports? What? I don't know. He's got 15 sports posters all around his house. I already know the answer to it, but I'm going to ask it. Why? Because I'm trying to get past the likability factor. And if I ask questions I know the answer to, it is a guarantee for me to progress and move forward. So where you get in trouble is you start asking open-ended questions that really have no relevance and you're just shooting from the hip. Do you like the cold weather? Absolutely not. I hate it with a passion. Like, uh-oh, here we go. So use the house around you. Start as you're driving up. And honestly, do intel on people on social media before you even go to their house. And if you can find commonality, go for it. Ask questions. You know the answer to it makes conversations really easy. Guys and gals, if you're married, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If I can ask my question ask my wife a question I already knew the answer to. I just feel like it just goes better when I don't know. I just like, why well, I didn't know that. I'm sorry. I asked that question. So, um, okay. We're almost done here now. The, I know this sounds ridiculous. Don't try to be somebody else. That's right. While you guys are on seller's appointments, don't try to be somebody you're not. So I don't care if you're if, number one, we don't need any more Zach or Rick's in the world. I promise you that. I know my family doesn't want that. And number two is, you know, God gave us our own unique set of abilities. You don't need to go and duplicate. I see so many people because see, they see their guru wearing a jacket. They got to wear a jacket because their guru wears fancy uh, tennis shoes. They think the tennis shoes going to help them. A lot of people are going to wear a hat because their coach wears a hat. And it's kind of cute. Like, but it's not going to help you on appointments. And if anything, if you are not your true authentic self, it is going to come through and it's going to cost you business. Be yourself. God's only made one of you. There's a reason for it. You need to accent it. Stop trying to be other people. 
It doesn't mean you can't emulate them and strive for their goals. But just because somebody wears a jacket doesn't mean you need to go wear a jacket. It's to me, it's it's I mean, I guess the person's flattered when you do it, but like I don't get it. I need everyone to be themselves. Thank God Elvis had the guts to go out there and be himself because everybody told him not to be the person he was going to be. And you saw how wildly popular because we still talk to him. There's movies. People still listen to his music. It's incredible. And if he didn't have the guts to go out and be himself, we would have never had the gift of Elvis. So you are the Elvis of the wholesaling. Go out there. If you're funny, go have fun with it. If you know how to connect with people, do that. If you're very skill set in numbers and reciting um, facts, you know, just make sure it's entertaining to your sellers. Just try not to go and duplicate your favorite person because you think they're cool. And if you thought you could be like them, it'd be really neat. It doesn't work. Being authentic is what people really resonate to. And to be honest with you, it's what most people resonate with me for. And it's why you like this because when you guys see me on air, when I'm off, I'm the exact same person. I don't have a show for you. It's kind of weird. Um, I can't say that about a lot of gurus that go out there. A lot of it's just they get off stage like they won't talk to anybody. They won't do anything. And I'm like, well, how can you be different than when you're on stage and off? So here's the key is I don't go on stage because I'm not in that like BS acting type of stuff. So my stage is here on the microphone with you guys, and I'm just going to be authentic. Your sellers know when you're being fake because it just seems cheesy and you make them uncomfortable. So like, don't do it. Last one. Negative talk about competitors. If you have competition there, realtors, other wholesalers, I broke this rule definitely in my first two years and I regret it. I made a lot of mistakes. You talking negatively about the competition makes you look bad, not your competition. So when you sit there and just trash them, it just makes you look like an idiot. So number one, don't talk negative about them. Just don't highlight them. Well, uh, Johnny over at ABC Home Buying, he says he can buy the house faster and pay me more than that. I go, that's great. I'm going to go back and talk about what I can do for you and what our company can do for you. I'm not going to put Johnny on the spotlight, but I'm not going to talk negatively about him. And then most of you wholesalers get really upset when like realtors listing in there. That's why I always tell you, talk to people about listing their home. If they're going to list it, they're going to talk to realtors and they might list it anyway. So you might as well get the elephant out of the room and say, why would you ever consider just listing the property? And if they say, no, 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 I don't like realtors or I don't like people parading through my house, then you can close that door. There's nothing worse when you go through the entire presentation and they tell you they're meeting with a realtor. That means you probably said something that made them uncomfortable or they lied to you in the initial qualifications. Either way, it's going to be wrong. So here's the bottom line. If you have competition, do not talk negatively in front of your seller about them. It just makes you look jealous. It makes you look scared and it makes you look incompetent. So whenever anyone trashes the competition in f like in front of me, especially when I'm like, I got competing realtors or something like that. I, I just instantly, I know what's going on. And I usually think it's a reflection of that person. If they're so insecure and they're so negative, if they would just focus on the skills they offered, this would be much easier. So um, let me see here. I take guys. I mean, th this is the basis of what not to say to sellers. And if you missed the first part of this, this is recorded, so it'll be there for you. Replace the word with what you want and what they need. So what do you need to get for this house? So it just, you got to get somewhere. So um, Axon says, home is a state of mind. You are correct there. What's up, Jason? How you doing? Um... I have one other one here. Let's see here. Which one was I missed? Um, so I see somebody put a question up here. I, I'm not going to promote like somebody else that I don't know, but um Someone's saying that their coach told them not to tell them they're doing a wholesale deal. So I addressed this in the beginning. Um, that's somewhat correct. I don't, I don't, you're technically doing wholesaling if you do it right and you're doing it via assignment. The reality is you are a cash buyer looking to buy the property. 
that's it. So if you go in using the word wholesaler or an investor, it's going to create problems for you. And for that reason, you don't want to do that. So um, that's kind of it. So let's jump on some lives because I know we've been running short on time the last few times. So Almaro, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me okay? Good, man. You've, uh, I, I needed it to be the first one today. <laughs> yeah, your, uh, your face isn't too torn up today. Nothing oh, no, not today. So not today. I, I took a couple <laughs> weeks off since that day. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I needed it too. I needed it too. It was bad. Like any little thing, any little thing that I did, with, like blow my nose, it was hurting. Yeah. So let me, I got a question for you. So you, you know, I got ADHD. So like when you fight somebody and you get kicked hard in the face or like a real bad body shot, I'm not saying it doesn't hurt, but like when you're, is your adrenaline running so high, you just don't feel it as much high. during the time? You don't, so like the only one that I felt, it was like last time when I got hit in the nose, Yeah. Um, I felt like, like. I broke my, my nose twice, so I felt like my nose move a little bit. Yeah. And that's why it was so swollen. But I took like two seconds, like, or five seconds to, yeah. to hold on my nose. Yeah. And then I was like, okay, let, let's keep sparring. Because it's the adrenaline, plus the blood is pumping. And it's like, okay, you hit me, but I'm coming back with something. No worries. <laughs> you see, something like that. And then after the fight and everything calms down, when you get back into like the locker room, that's when you start feeling a whole lot, right? Yeah, that that you don't feel like you feel a little bit sore. You don't feel yeah. like my nose. I wasn't feeling yeah. the pain on the nose. It was just afterwards. Um, but most of the time, it, 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 you have to wait it out like the whole day after you sleep. That's yeah. when you feel everything. Yeah, especially the man those inside leg kicks and stuff. Man, I oh, see the yeah. welts fall on people. Man, those things just gotta. It's funny I don't know how you guys do that, man. Because I, I would be one leg kick like that. I might suck up one. The next one, I'm like going because that shin on shin, man, that that just looks so painful. Oh yeah, I, that those are bad. I I broke my shin playing football, so I uh, barely throw kicks. So when I throw kicks, it has to be like a knee or something. I don't throw the leg kicks just because I'm thinking, oh, crazy. my leg is gonna pop. I broke I don't my want... toe once, man. It like took me to my knees. I'm like, I can't imagine breaking your entire femur or shin or. Yeah. No, he's I tell you, I watched some UFC fights this week. I, it's like, I was, although I, I'll watch any of the fights because I, I know once they get to that caliber, how hard it is to even get to that position. But I'm getting spoiled with like the, some oh, of the fights. You're going to get some good ones. Crazy. Yeah. You're going to uh, get some good ones with John Jones and, and Zero Gang. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's good though. But, you know, me and Zach just love it because I, I, I just come from a wrestling background. So I, I like, I know how much effort it takes just for a, a takedown and i'm just like man oh yeah and when you're when you're in there working you guys gotta understand like if you have to like concentrate on just breathing it's it's such a weird feeling and that clock is in like slow motion when you're out of energy it's like yes and remember i only i only did six minutes in high school so like people oh, doing 15 to 25 minute fights a lot of rounds and more for and that, boxing yeah oh for boxing we do like like eight rounds and then after we end up like our boxing sections, we jump to the MMA and it's worse. Oh, yeah. it's bad. It's, but but this is the thing. I pref, like I don't have much fear as I have fears making calls. Yeah. Making so let's calls talk about that. I want to help different. you out with it, man. Because <laughs> what this guy does is insane. So I'm like, oh, selling it just seems like so simple compared to getting your face smashed in. So, And for um, me, it's the whole opposite. It's like, oh, man. How can I get throughout this call? And then, but this is the thing. After I make like 10 calls, I'm comfortable making calls. Yeah, it's kind of like when you get in the ringo after you get like, you know, the first few after the first rounds round, after it's in like, boxing after the first round for me. Yeah. But I, I remember when I used to wrestle, uh, this is way back in high school. Every now and then, like a guy would grab you. And like when you feel that hand strength, you're just like, oh, you kind of yeah. go like this, like, uh oh. <laughs> like that, I can't describe like hand, like you know, like hand strength when you're grappling. It's like it 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 feels like a like a like a truck just like pulling in with hydraulics. I'm like, oh, yeah. And so you learned like if you guys ever want to know what wrestling, don't worry about bench press. Everything's back. Everything's back, back, back. So I I looked at the guy. You see a guy with a huge back in this <laughs> giant tattoo at like age 16, 17. I go, oh my god. <laughs> I go, I'm going to get killed. But like, it's just, 
you know, it's funny because so many of us talk ourselves out of the fight before it even happens. I even see it at like the UFC level. It's not nearly as much, but like people know when they're scared inside and, oh, and yeah, uh, it. it's just a different level, man. But it's just, uh, it's crazy. Listen, wholesaling is like no different. You just, you're not physically getting beat up. You're just mentally getting beat up. Yes. That's and the hard honestly, thing. sometimes as, as for men, I'm probably the same woman. Sometimes it's easier. It'd just be easier if somebody punched you in the face a couple of times as far as like, like messing with your head. You know exactly what I'm talking Cause like when guys have a disagreement, let's just take it out back and call it a day. And that's all high school and college and even grade school, different world today. Cause people just don't fight anymore. They, they no. do different things. And, but like a lot of people have a massive fear of just cold calling. And I'm just like, I go, which would you rather do? Be punched in the face twice or like cold call? Like, I take, I the, take punches the two punches. I know, going <laughs> and I know what to expect. And uh, you know what a lot of people struggle with is their own emotions. Like when people get rejected or they get like really nasty with you. And you just, at some point, you have to decide in life that they can't hurt me. And if I don't care, it's not that you don't care what they think. I'm just not going to let it pull me backwards. Because if you talk to 100 people and 90 people reject you and you're going to base, well, the majority of them say no, that's the problem that, that messes with your head and your psyche. And that's the challenge with what we're dealing with. Yes, I got my teeth kicked in today, man. I got kicked in twice bad. It was like, oh, really? And I prepared hours and hours for very big. It is what it is. I'm just yeah. going to try to recircle and see if I can make one out of the two work. But I know one's not going to work. So the other one just... I don't know, man. People just get difficult. Some yeah, very nasty mean? words oh, were man. said to me, but I'm just like, you know, maybe you just need a little bit of time. <laughs> I could, you know, I calm down and they really like, I'm talking about grown men in their sixties. Oh, wow. Yeah. Like, so it doesn't, by the way, once, once you're between 20 and 80, it's like everybody has the same tolerance. It's just some people trigger a lot worse than others. So it's, uh, I, I equate a lot. What we do is I always taught my son, if you can deal with wrestling and wrestle with, with, a strong kid, really man for six minutes. People are like, well, how long six minutes? I go, do you know like the average street fight probably lasts 20, 30 seconds, right? Oh yeah. I gets punched. Not even a back, minute. They break it up and that's it. Now when you go all in. A good punch would do it. <laughs> yeah. So like, I'm not the best. I, you know, I haven't gotten a lot of fist fights. I did when I was young because I, I had a lot of time on my hands, but like you could probably hit me pretty good, but like if you go down, I, I know enough to take you down to make you miserable. Oh, so yeah. like most people don't know dominant positions. Like if someone goes, because when the fight goes to the ground, it's usually a whole different game. Yes, that wrestling. And if you know how to get on oh, someone's back and just control them and stay on the hips and kind of keep going. But that I just wish everyone would learn the basic mechanics of how like to defend themselves because a lot of people. They should. Guys are all talk when it comes to fighting. And it's like, most guys, just so you know, most fights wind up on the ground at some point. Yes. And if you know that, if you know how to like deal with people on the ground, because they, they can't be. But if you let someone get on top of you, man, it's like bad news. Oh, Anyways, nice. I'll stop the UFC because I, I, I can talk about this stuff all day long. I love it, man, because to me, it's the like, I think it's a really safe sport and it teaches people about discipline, discipline. about training <laughs> and everything else with it, man. And it, like wholesaling is. It's very different, but a lot of the stuff's the same because I look at it like there's a lot of days, guys, like I just like, man, what do I do this for? Like, and then I remind my days when I have huge wins, when I have a huge wind, it fuels me for months, especially when I started out. So I get rejected by hundreds, if not thousands of people, I get one or two wins. And those one or two wins saved me from doing my corporate job and everything else I did. And that's, what, I, yeah. that's my issue. Like I'm having problem with like having those good leads because like um, I was doing the Atlanta market, but then I spoke with Zach and Zach was telling me if I was using a dialer and I told him that I wasn't right. And you think what? Like, if I was using a dialer. Okay. Yes. Um, and I wasn't. So he was like, Oh, just stick to your market. So what I did, I'm using prop stream, but what I did, I put a, a high, a high equity. Mm -hmm. um, one of the videos that you posted uh, like um, a couple of days ago, the five um what was it it was like the the five list to pull so i okay. put the high equity one and i started calling that one it's funny because when he told me that that was last week to start calling this market and doing more of this market but mm -hmm. i kind of like 
I don't know. I kind of got, I kind of got stuck and I didn't know, even though I knew what to do, I feel like I didn't know how to do it or how to start it again. It was like a whole reset. Yeah. So, so which market are you doing right now? Uh, I'm in Connecticut, so I'm doing hard for Yeah. Because that's okay. the one that has like a uh, hundred thousand people plus. You got a big population there. Yes. So, and, and the, how you say it? the medium um, ARV is like 250. 300 it's cheaper in florida yeah so florida, like florida went from 100 like the 440 i'm like I've, i've never like the numbers are staggering here it's crazy yeah and I uh but that's like already. listen if you can ever do stuff in like your backyard it, it's usually either e even though they're even higher price points it's always easier because you don't have to learn the market you you kind of know which sides of town are which um But the problem is we are we are still in the middle of a market reset cycle, um, so to speak. And there's like sweet spots in it. So prices are still dropping. Some areas they're actually going up. I, as shocking as that sounds, we have parts in Florida where it's still challenging. I have one market like it. I've never seen anything like it before. It's like standing room only for deals. Oh, wow. So we're back to paying like a lot more for that. And then on the other side of town, I have to like go on the other extreme low. So The problem is if you're in a virtual market, it's hard to wrap your heads around when those price, the, the prices change and what your cash buyers need. The only difficult part in Florida is cash buyers, if it's under like 250, they're easy. Once it gets above 250, it's a lot of work. So 250, anything below is considered cheap in Florida and it moves lightning fast and there's standing room only. Once you approach 300, it's like a different ball game. And then once you get in the 350 to 450, it's a pain in the butt. You got to, I started in this market. They were $30,000 houses. So it's like, it's just a number. I don't mind with that. But the biggest change we are all experiencing is what cash buyers will pay for stuff and their tolerance. And that's the challenge we're having with it. So, um, so you switch from doing virtual to like the local market. Yes, but I'm still like calling, like I'm using prop stream to call. Um, I'm gonna see if I can put the government list um pretty soon because uh, that's probably gonna be my best bet now. Because, Always. Always. Like this, um, this high equity feels like I'm calling, but I'm like, okay, I, like I don't even get good like leads. Like, and I, this is the thing. One. So how many have you called? I pulled a thousand eight hundred, and I feel like I I think I called like three hundred today, because I'm nothing. doing by hand and nothing. Like one, there was one guy that was like, "Oh yeah, I'm in Puerto Rico," but as soon as I get from I get from Puerto Rico, um, I'm thinking on selling. Yeah, that's the only one. But out of those calls, most, also all of them was like, "Nope, nope, nope, nope. don't call me." So, so just to let you know, high equity is. Um, for those who don't know it, a high equity is just basically a list that um, they have a lot more equity in the house than they have um, uh, debt on it. So what, what was your cutoff when you ran the high equity list? Um, Percentage wise. I think I had like a 50 because okay. yeah, I had it. a little bit too much yeah, numbers. Yeah. yeah. As you get lower, they become more and more of a pain in the butt. Yes. And then if you get too high they don't care. So like 40 between 45 and 55 is kind of the sweet spot for high equity, but high equity, they're tough list right now because we have the same challenge here in Florida with them. We run the crap. We have to run every list because we, we run so much marketing. I said, um, our, our best list still right now, are government list, they're harder to work. They take much more energy to get. And that's the only reason why we do better with them. So it's you, you just, you're going to have to be very persistent and patient getting those lists because That's our challenge. Like we all have to draw straws in our company who has to chase the list for the month. So and for me, the lowest on the totem pole. Do I have to go to, to pull up the government list? Some of them I see, I was seeing in, in free wholesaling that, that I can do them through the computer. But a lot of them. Some you can, but uh, as I said, that the, it's all based on, you know, your local market. So every, every municipality, every county has a different way of doing it. Um, the problem is they love to reject you on email. They like to do it on the phone in person. It's a pain in the ass to turn you down. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of work. It's like, so here's the challenge you deal with them. Like they're public record, but they have privacy policies against it. So 
they're all public records. You guys argue the wrong thing. You have to figure out how to penetrate their privacy policy. And you have to do it nicely. Yes. There's no argument. They're not public records. They are, guys. But what they're, they're the, the, the little filter they're catching you on is the privacy policy. So you have to befriend them and figure out how to get in there. The best way to, if you, so if you want to break into someone's house, make sure someone living in that house tells you how to do it. It's the same thing when you try to get these lists. Make sure somebody working in that government building knows how to get you in, but you're going to have to befriend them. You're going to have to compliment the heck out of them and just build a massive amount of rapport. That's how we do it. And by the way, I've been rejected multiple times. I send my wife in, she gets whatever, like, <laughs> but women get <laughs> more than guys. Is, like, it's time. just the truth. Exactly. You give me a woman on a phone versus a man. They just, they get further. It's a True. fact guys. Don't sit True. there and argue it. It's the truth. I'm sorry. Yeah. That's a fact. Like, I sure. love female acquisitions. People they're excellent for virtual and on the phone. But in person, I always worry about their safety. But it's true. So get those government lists and just get cracking on them. I, I think you're going to have a better success rate, but you, you just got to kind of keep grinding through them. And um, if know. I would have to pull up a list from PropStream that you recommend that it could do better than the high equity, which one should I try? Uh, in PropStream, um, I would try the vacant list and the pre probate. Probably those right off the bait. Now I got like six hundred of those. I swear. <laughs> you don't have. You don't have. You only. You don't have to pull them every month. You just. You in your case, I'd pull it like once a quarter, and just give it a shot, and then make sure you filter the ones that are on market on MLS on the filters. Yeah. Like I was doing. I. It's funny because I. I filter the bacon ones, and I did exactly what you said just now. Yeah. Should I do two on two years of ownership as well, minimum? Uh, I did no, it. I, I just. Like that's how it's up to was. you. You got to you. So yeah, I always tell everybody come a ninja like list warrior and you just play around with it. But in the beginning, like the problem with the pre probates, there's not a lot to begin with. So because yes. even if you get a list of 100, you're probably going to call like half of them because like your common sense says this, this is ridiculous. Like some of them are like vacant piece of land, like nowhere, like some of it you can kind of look at. So um just you don't know, get through it. The pre probates and the vacant to work well because you only got to pull them like once a quarter. And that list is already built in your subscription, so it doesn't cost you anymore. Um, and then I would add the government list because whether there's smoke, there's fire, this is usually going to be your freshest leads on people that are going to need help. And by the way, the market should get worse all the way through the end of this year. I've already watched all the data. Q4 seems like I don't think a whole lot, it's nothing's going to get better between now and uh, December, November, December. So you got to look at it. So the idea is figure out your, your, your method of madness as soon as possible and just yeah. get into a rhythm and just like, keep it going. I, I rather anybody stay local to home. Cause it's just easier in the long run. Yeah, and the funny thing is by the summer, I'm, I'm, I'm I should be in Florida cause um, my girlfriend was been thinking to for moving like three years ago. And yeah. this summer we decided, even if I don't make a deal, I'm still, gonna move out there i have like a family member out there so what part of florida um my friend lives in leesburg okay leesburg yeah that's where okay. he lives so i guess i'm gonna go through that area well, first yeah you can spar <laughs> as long as you promise not to smash my face in and break my arm i promise i won't so you let probably... me i got one last question for you <laughs> do you guys test like breaking points of like submissions of what you can handle like because it's when you get oh, in the yeah. ring and they, they're they're you know got an arm bar wrenched before a fight if yeah. if i know i have a fight and my friend like brandon the one that's gonna fight yeah. in in las vegas if he, if yeah. he has a fight we have to test each other if we hit ourselves hard to knock ourselves out sometimes yeah but once we know we hurt one of us when, if I hurt him, he's kind of stops. Yeah. And if he hurts me, he kind of like take it more light then. And let me ask you, do you have to like at least, obviously it, it eventually happens when you fight enough people because someone's always better than you. But when you guys are sparring, do you have an event where someone just says, listen, I'm going to put a, a rear naked choke on you. I'm just going to like, so you oh. can kind of feel like what, when it goes out. Sometimes it happens. Yeah. Like sometimes yeah, just, when you're <laughs> sparring, it goes so bad. It's, it's supposedly listen, supposed to I be boxing. I had that happen in high school wrestling. I, I got... <laughs> Because in, in high school, they can include the arm. And if they're good enough and they're powerful enough, they can still ch like choke you out. But I, I was always curious. I'm like, because people understand an it's not comfortable. You just black out from lack of oxygen. You usually come right back. But yes. Um, but man, 
That's how he feels. When you guys feels wrench bad. those necks and stuff. I'm like, man, I go. It's just I, I'd yeah. be tapping out so fast, man. It's oh, like, you should see us when we spar. And it's funny. He's he, the guy. He's fighting um, yeah. in Las Vegas. He's fight for for American Top Team. Yeah, in wow. Florida. You come to Florida, man. Let's. Uh, I you gotta like help me get some seeds. I I just love it, dude. I I think it's just to me like I used to watch this type of fighting and like when they did it back in like ninety ninety one when it was. It was just chaotic. Two guys just went in there. That was crazy back then. <laughs> Somebody yeah, that didn't know how now, to fight. Now you look at it, it's like, it's so specialized. Honestly, it's like, unless you're an extra, in my opinion, unless you're an extreme athlete, you have to train most of your entire life to do this. Kids start oh, out yeah. grappling and wrestling. And if they can figure that out, which is actually one of the harder parts, because a lot of guys who fight, they don't want to wrestle. And when they yes. go against a guy who can wrestle, it's just tough. So, Wholesaling is the same thing. You got to just kind of figure out each facet. You just got to figure out how to get leads. And then you figure out like submissions and everything else. I'm like, you know, you do creative finance, you do wholesaling, you do all sorts of stuff on it, but just get your core skills down. And yeah, I was uh, taught today watching videos just because I've been me making mistakes on one of the videos yeah. to the, I think you posted today that it said basically the mistakes that you, why you haven't gotten your first deal yet. And it was because you're making this and this and this mistake. Yeah. And I was making three of them. And I'm like, okay, I'm not staying in one of, of like stick to one um, basically market. Yeah. Um, follow just like one like rule, keep into mm -hmm. this one. Like all these little things that I'm watching is like, okay, I was making yeah. mistakes at this. So now I have to stay yeah. consistent, but at this. So you th think about the training you do in MMA. Like, I remember the, the, when my son, the first time I sent him out to wrestling, you know what I told him? Because I, I knew the guy was going to destroy him. <laughs> That's they threw him on the varsity <laughs> team. I just said, I told my son, I go, don't get pinned. That's it. That was your goal. Because I knew it, there was no chance he was going to win. Like he, he, had, he had a half Nelson, you know, and a single leg takedown. That's all he knew. He's, he, was only, he only wrestled for like a month. Oh, you and have the coach to goes, see. hey, I'm going to throw you in. We got a hot. I go, dude, like he doesn't like. He'll get it. I go, it's just because people understand like you progress as a person over four years. The same thing happens in wholesaling. It's like you just got to got one move. You just got to call people and eventually you'll figure it out. But like I remember looking at him. He's like, what do you mean? Don't get pinned. I'm like, don't get pinned. Now, yes. I he didn't get pointed out either. It's like he won like uh, he lost 14 to two. But I'm like, OK. And then we used to progress and they say, hey, we got to get five points in this match. I go, you just need to get a. Uh, a takedown better than before feet. and you just kind of do it. And then once then after that, they hit the weight room, he figured out conditioning. And then at the point, whereas when he got really good, like he didn't need me anymore. He's like, dad, you're like, and I wasn't <laughs> that good. And now. sometimes <laughs> training your own kid is the worst thing you can do. And yes, you just got to let him make the mistakes and train. And then I couldn't keep him out of the weight room. He conditioned, he'd run 10 miles. And just like, he just came, he's like, I'm just going to, and then he said, now I'm going to make everybody pay for the crap I was put through. And that's where we kind of got to it. And that's how I look at wholesaling your first year or two. You're just like, <laughs> hey, I just don't want to get pinned. I don't want to get sued. I don't want anything. And like you just keep making and you just, okay, I'm going to get a few more points here. I'm going to get a few more points. And after a while, and all those failures you've ever had in wholesaling, one day they become your best ally. It's the weirdest things. I know a lot of people say like that. Honestly, guys, I just got ran under the bus under a deal. I partnered up with someone. I trusted them. Yeah, no, we mean they didn't do their like... part of it. I go, I appreciate it. Now I know where I stand. I know where I will never be near you again. And that's that's fine. Like I, I do a lot of deals. I'm not worried about it. But you figure people out quickly. So like if you keep doing the same thing over and over and you're getting the same crappy results then it's on you. We all have to make pivots with it. So keep doing what you're doing. You're still, you're, you're still in the, I don't want to get pinned phase. And like, how do I move forward with this? And you're doing it. So just keep do the two lists I told you about and add the government list and then just keep pressing forward. Okay. Definitely. will. I'm going to keep you posted as well. Okay. Plus. Definitely, man. Okay, buddy. Keep in touch. I, I, I got some information for the next one. <laughs> What's that? Um, about the whole fighting, like you okay, have to well, go okay. see something nice. I don't want to but I tell you after. Fight. I know everybody in the fight, but like I love like Florida. So now, like uh, me and my son go out and we seek all like the uh, you know the local low level fights, but it's a little weird. We have some problems with it because they they can get uh... little secret. You know why you should go see? 
what let's say i'm going to go sparring to another gym mm -hmm. just sparring in another gym yeah. it gets better than a fight i'm telling you yeah oh man oh, my, we don't my respect friend none used of to, them. uh back in the day before it started my friend started uh i think it was imperial down in like coconut uh grove but uh it was just such a financial undertaking and the economy was rough that was like 2012 13 And he used to like he dude some of the most amazing names and pictures like back in the day, but the problem is once the corporations kind of took over UFC with sponsorships and stuff, yeah. And then you had like teams and like it was as it was. He's like it's crazy because I'm supposed to have all these eight guys here and then they're going to bring in their team and I can't charge them and then this guy coaches, and uh, he lost millions of dollars. It was like oh, really man. cool, but I'm like. Because he asked me for a loan. I'm like, there's no way. There's no way, <laughs> no. man. I, like, I get out of this. It's like you have the top food chain. And then, like, and it's going to be interesting with see what uh, Jake Paul, like, he, he guarantees he's going to change, like, um, the mixed pay. martial arts. Hopefully. But... Hopefully he, he gets the pay. The pay. They get, yeah. He make it better because, honestly, they're not paying much. No, I know. Well, they, you know, you have the top. I, I honestly don't think, and I'm not knocking, like, Dana White, but I think um, – When he retires and stuff, I think a lot of changes will probably come about, but we'll see. They got to take. He's going to change. Better. Yeah, we'll it's see. It's going to change for sure. Okay, bud. I'll talk to you soon. Man. Thank Go you for your it. time. Appreciate okay, it. See ya, Xavier. Are you there? Sorry about all the fight talk, guys. I just no, uh, you, I enjoy the UFC, man. You all right? I'm here. You can hear me? <laughs> yeah, man. How you doing? Hey, I'm doing good. Uh, so yesterday I talked to Zach about a property that I was talking with the seller about. And basically, he wants $165,000 for it. Well, that's his price. He originally wanted two hundred k but I talked him down to $165,000. But I found out okay. that the units will each sell. It's a duplex, so each unit could be rented out for $1,000. So Got it. Zach, Zach said try to make my max allowable offer $150,000. But I'm trying to lock it up for $130,000. You have any advice? And I just talked to Zach yesterday. So, so what's uh, what 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 state are you at? You don't have to give me the exact market. Oh, I'm in Michigan. I'm the college kid. I talked to you. Uh, <laughs> I talked to you okay. like earlier, like September. But I'm in college right now, so I, this is back home. And uh, well, I can say that it's in Commons, Michigan. So okay, is it? So, wait, say, say the city again because I love the city's name. <laughs> Kalamazoo, Michigan. <laughs> yeah. You know why? Because I used to, like, my first mortgage I got, the uh, the company was out of Kalamazoo. Yeah. I got Kalamazoo. I go, that is the coolest freaking <laughs> name. And now, like, you bring it up, I was like, Kalamazoo. So, yeah. okay, so it's, um, how much does he want for it? Like, wh wh what's he asking you for it? So, right now, we agreed on 165, but talking to Zach, I feel like that's kind of high. The way Zach explained it, that's kind of high, but The area is it's located downtown. So the way it works, it's a big real estate development coming. Like the city is offering money for certain houses. So I think it could be a good investment property for a landlord or anyone. So what's what's the issue with the property? I mean, you tell you why he's selling it. Is it vacant or? Yeah, it's uh, he really has motivation because he's getting into the commercial, like the storage units. And, Got uh, it. And by the know, way. There's a huge, huge run up in like the commercial storage space. Like, yeah, one I have like, like, it's bigger than uh, apartments right now. It's like, I mean, they're buying them up. Like the competition's gone through the roof. It used to be, I'm not going to say an easy play, but it was much, much easier than it is yeah. now. It's challenging now. So, um, so the uh, the thousand for each door is that a real number? That's that. That's the question. That's what I'm saying. It's like I looked at the area, how much they rent out. Zach said, look at how much they are renting out for in the area. And it's like it's from seven fifty to thirteen hundred. Okay. It's in the price range. And what kind of so, what kind of repairs you need on this thing? Um really is he said the roof is good. I want to show you pictures. Zach kind of he like <laughs> he didn't want to see the pictures yesterday, but well picture pictures you, aren't like I, I don't want to like get into the picture yeah, yeah. it's uh it just How, how yeah. what kind of money does the uh, end user have to put into the properties? Which what you really got to figure out. Yeah, I feel like it's around the work is going to need. It's no stove inside, nothing. So 
yeah. you're gonna need around like thirty to fifty thousand to be a decent property. So Zach's right. You're gonna have to take it off that one sixty five number because people are just they're gonna want that discount to get it up and user. So I'm not overly f um, familiar with the area. Mm -hmm. um, you got to find out what a cash buyer is really willing to pay for it. Like in yeah. Florida, duplexes, they still go really fast because people right. like them. Um, That's what so I'm saying. You know how to do the, uh, the re do you know how to calculate the uh, return on investment on this? Uh, I do not, but I was just doing it by 70%. Yeah. I was doing so it by here's, here's how uh, landlords and investors are going to calculate this for you. It's real simple. You want to take the net. So say it earned two thousand dollars a year, two thousand dollars a month. Multiply that by twelve. That's twenty four thousand. Um, and let's just say it cost, I don't know, four thousand between the tax and insurance. So it yields about twenty thousand dollars a month. You just divide that by the price, and you get the yield. So if you divide that by, say, a hundred and thirty k, that gives you around a fifteen percent return. Right. Okay. Which is, by the way, is the same thing as a cap rate. So basically, I was says if someone were to invest X amount of money into it, they would get about a 15% return. 15% is respectable. Mm -hmm. um, if the number gets too high, it usually means they're going to lose their ass because they're probably not going to get their capital back. And if the number's too low, it has to be like a crazy, insane property, like next to a Starbucks or a Home Depot or something like that. So right. the problem is at 160. You have to sell it at a certain number to make money. So if you try to sell it at 150, 160, which is sounds like with the repairs is what you're going to wind up being it. That's why he's trying to tell you to take off that number because people like there's a certain number they won't go below to get a return on. Yeah. Like it's once you get around seven, eight percent, like it it doesn't really make a lot of sense because most multifamily on a duplex in this country, mm -hmm. most of them are at least 10%. And usually the max is around 18, 19%, depending okay. on how much repair they need. So you want to be priced somewhere in the middle. So I've taught you kind of how to calculate that number. Yeah. Because in the end, this is what they're always going to say. They're going to figure out how much money you have to put into it <clears throat> and how much of a return they're going to get. And if that's right. why I always ask investors, what do you expect to get a return on like when you buy properties like this? And someone will say, a lot of them will say 10 to 12%. That's why Zach's trying to have you target 15 because yeah. you got some room to negotiate it. That when someone says I can get a 30% return on a property like that, I know it's fake because very rarely are you going to get that from somebody because um by the way I bought them like that and I lost my ass yeah. almost every time because yeah. you can't fix sometimes where a property is located. So if it's in a bad neighborhood or there's a ton of crime, mm -hmm. as nice as you make the property, you cannot fix the surrounding area of those yeah. types of deals. So those are the only ones you got to kind of watch for but um, with the repairs and stuff, I would just try to get the best discount you can because you got to sell it to someone and make a profit on it. So, right. um, so I don't know what the numbers are going in the area. The most that thing would sell for theoretically would be around 200 K, which would give you around the 10% mark, but people are going to want to take off for repairs and stuff like that. So you're going to have to find out what that number is. The bet. So did you ink the contract yet? No, I did not make it yet because I was going to write it out last night. But I'm like, oh, I don't so know. just say, listen, I, I didn't, you know, I didn't figure, you know, I forgot about the repairs and just let's have to think about the the best I can do is 130. Just see what he says. The worst he's going to do is say no to you. you. Can renegotiate it even if you get it 135, 145. You got room in it to sell it because I think you're going to wind up selling around the 160 to 170 mark when it's said yeah. and done. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. And even 150 wouldn't be bad. It's just 15k off what he's asking for, but that'd be the closest I could get. You're, you're better. Yeah. So you're in a better position because once you ink that thing, this is a brutal conversation to have. Yeah, yeah. And just go listen. I talked to my partner, man. Like he, he just he can't go above this number. Right. And then if you know if you need to go above that number, you can say, listen, I'll just I'll kick in the difference. You know, you can have a reason to go up to it. But always just just you always go for like as cheap as you can possibly get them because in today's market you've got to pass savings on to your cash buyers because they are a major pain in the butt right now and they but, they have a lot of stuff coming their way so they're sitting back going, okay at the right price i'll buy it for this yeah and i haven't even talked to a cash buyer yet i mean yeah i haven't found yeah, I said, 
have one more conversation at worst case scenario you'll find out what this guy's bottom line number is yeah. and then if you have to think about it one more day and then start talking to cash buyers to see if you can even get them up to that number you could kind of do that way but you can't give out the address when you do that otherwise they're going to yeah. backdoor you so do yeah. not give out an address until you have it under contract yeah. and is the whole thing vacant or is there a tenant on one side oh it's all vacant both of them yeah, that'd be an easy one, the wholesale. You just got to find out the price market. So the other thing I do is I start calling cash buyers tomorrow to see, hey, I got this size duplex in this area. Needs about 20, 30K worth of work. You know, where do you think you could come in? Let me see if I can get it done for you. Okay. And just say, listen, I'm working with a seller if it makes sense. And some people are like, man, I do any, if I can't find anything below like 180 in those neighborhoods. Yeah, so, so get some you intel from your cash buyers. So mm -hmm. when you talk to them, you can have a little bit of a confidence level. Yeah. Um, because sometimes in these market guys, I do a little bit what we call reverse wholesaling. When someone gives me ridiculous numbers, I don't think he's giving any ridiculous numbers. Yeah, no. Is like they're motivated, but the number doesn't work. So what I do yeah. is I, I go, okay, well, let me think about it. And I go out to all my cash buyers. I go, listen, I got this three, two on the South side of town. It's about 1500 square feet. I probably get to you around 175. Needs about right. 15, 20 K worth of work. Oh, he goes, dude, I'll take 10 of them if you got them like that. I'm like, oh, 175. Okay. Then I go well, straight back. And when you negotiate with a seller and you know exactly what you can sell for it, it's a whole new ball game, man. It's like, yeah. but here's the secret, guys. You can't share addresses when you do it because they're just going to cut you out of it. Yeah, because I was talking to a real estate. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. a lot of us are walking away from deals. We just can't make it work because the cash buyers are much more difficult. So, Instead of just saying, screw you, I don't ever deal with you anymore. I go, well, I tell you what, give me a day or two to think about it. Let me see if I can scrape that up. And then I'm going to go out there and call everybody I know. And once I find someone that's like for real, then yeah. I'm going to start working it and doing it that way. Because sometimes when prices are dropping, you don't know where the bottom is. And if you do the reverse wholesaling, mm -hmm. who cares? Like I've made hundreds of thousands of dollars just using that technique where I was going to walk away. And sometimes I've lost out on deals. Someone signs a contract a day or two later. I missed it. I go, crap, I left 25 grand up in the air because I wasn't comfortable, but that's the business. Yeah. But it being vacant and stuff like that, I would try to get under contract and go crazy on it because duplexes are still very attractive in the United States. Yeah. Exactly. Two properties for one, they're financeable, like they're perfect. To yeah. me, I'd rather do a, a duplex, triplex, or a quadplex opposed to a single family any day because it's just easier. Especially yeah. for the landlords. So yeah, Zach's so 100 percent on. Like I'm I dude, I trained the kids. So like trust me, he knows what he's talking yeah. about. Yeah, I already know. That's why I wanted to talk to you too. And then also with finding my cash buyer, um, do you think I should just I know call title companies, uh call everybody. Cash. Call Your everybody. Rates. Like yeah. honestly, you cannot call enough people in today's market. Okay. The days of calling two or three cash buyers, it's over, man. If I yeah. told you what we went through with cash buyers in our business, you you wouldn't even believe it. We have right. one person full time. That's all they do, because they 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 yeah. follow. So, guys, every cash buyer you've had before, twenty twenty three, the whole business has reset. Okay. That like is when people aren't buying, they're not buying. They're not useful to you. So you got to find someone. Someone's always looking to buy a property. Like you've got to understand, there's always someone looking to buy a property. Just like when someone's selling a bottle of water, mm -hmm. someone's always looking to buy. You told me twenty thirty years ago you could sell a bottle of water for two bucks. I'd say like, you gotta be nuts. You can just drink it out of the hose. I'm old school, but someone like just, they like the convenience factor and they still do it. Matter of fact, I saw the other day, there's a brilliant guy that went out there. Just show you everything's for sale life. You know, these energy uh, drinks, they're like, they're such colorful labels and people pay like five bucks for them. You know what I'm talking about, right? The Red yeah. Bulls and all that other stuff. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So apparently there's a guy who just sells like, I guess kids think it's really cool to drink these drinks. Mm -hmm. And he just sells, I think flat water and like carbonated water in these things. And he sells them for like three 99 and uh, he's making millions doing it. Wow. So he's not really selling energy. No, he's, he's marketing to the kids that want to look cool, but like yeah. be healthy. I'm just like, Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh my that makes God. sense. Like, that's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Is that absolutely nuts? And he spends all, he says a majority of my um, budget is spent on marketing. He's like, it right. all comes down to marketing. So it's, yeah. um, it's so funny, man. I'll, I'll keep yeah. black. So, but and remember just, you got to call as many cash buyers as possible and be careful when you call your title companies. 
unless you've done business with them or have a relationship with them, they're hesitant to give you that information right off the bat. But yeah, yeah. you can also go, listen, I'm going to give you this deal, but I guess if you're not going to give me that information, <laughs> yeah. you know, if they're not going to cooperate with you, you got to like, okay, let me kind of figure it out. So just say, listen, do you have a really good cash buyer looking for a duplex in this area? I would love to share the deal. And then you make them look like the hero because they find the deal. Okay. So make them, let them get credit for it because they always love to take it. And um, once you do that, you'll find out if you can have some nice conversations with your title company, mm -hmm. they know every player in your market. It's unbelievable. The stuff um, actually I've sat down with a title company in one hour and got more information than I could get in like a decade in a computer. There's no way you can get that kind of detailed information. They know how much money they got. They know how many deals they own. They know how many deals they want to buy and they know exactly what their budget is and who's the decision maker in it. It's like gold. But you got to find quality title companies that do a lot of business in your market. Yeah. And the key is the longer they're in business, the better the information is going to be. If they just started a year or two ago, it's not going to be that good. Yeah, exactly. So you got it, man. Just go out and get the deal, man. You got it. Yeah. Just right. you want to get it as cheap as possible so you have options and you have places to go with it, okay? All right. I appreciate it. And Okay, man. Also, virtual. This is my last thing. Is It's like I'm closing because I'm back at school, so it's back at home. Home is an hour away, but... Right now, I don't. What, have what are you studying in school? It's uh business and economics, and then my minor is real estate development. So okay. it's really like I seen you talk about the business aspect in the college world, and it's like you're right. Sometimes the criteria is it's nowadays it's easier to just do your own thing. But I'm trying to well, learn. Just 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 look at it through school, uh, college as an extension of your grade school. Right. It's nothing more than that, dude. It's not it's just like that. I'm just here. A lot of people think it's going to solve their problems. Most people wait till the day they graduate. They have the pomp and circumstance, the big ceremony. And then they right. look at their parents and they're like, what do I do now? And you know what most parents go? It's like, now you got to figure it out. Don't be that like you're figuring it out now and you're learning as your options go. I always look at colleges. I'm not against college. Yeah. I'm just not into anybody running up debt for college. I think that's yeah. ridiculous. See, my schooling is free though. So that's why I kind of, well, there you I, go. I so if, it, if it's school. paid for and you're not like, uh, you're not putting the burden on yourself or your family yeah. before just get through it as soon as you can. And anyone who tells you the greatest time of your life is college. It's means they, they did it wrong. Like yeah. think yeah. about that. Like I, in college, I lived on ramen noodles and beer. Do you think that was the greatest <laughs> time of my life? Like no. it wasn't, it was disgusting. Like I looked yeah. at them. It's like, I, yeah. I got out of shape. The I got guns. undisciplined because I went from a disciplined environment to an undisciplined. And yeah. uh, honestly, I, I, I kind of got lost in college. I ch like most people go to college to try to fit in. So the yeah. crazy part is being a wholesaler. You're doing the complete opposite of what everyone else is doing. That's why college is hard for wholesalers for the most part. Yeah. You're doing the opposite of what everyone else is doing it. So you're just going to get massive amount of resistance. It's like, it's overwhelming. It's like, so, yeah. So it's like understanding that if you do that, I tell people, I go, nobody knows if you got your degree online or you, you paid for housing in person. They don't give a crap. Nobody sure. ever asked you in an interview, did you go to that school for four years and did you stay there? Now, here's my degree. There's no, it doesn't, they doesn't care. So guys, think differently at college. Don't let the, the system manipulate you. And you, you still make good contacts and stuff in college, but like, if you're doing what everybody else doesn't, you have to understand like you're going to have to be somewhat of a loner. And that's the part that sucks because most college is about fitting in. Yeah. And people are like, oh, it's such accomplishment. Look at Johnny. He's living on his own. Like Johnny's <laughs> living on your credit card. You're paying for everything. He's out partying every night. And you think he's getting an education to figure stuff out on his own on an antiquated system. Now we got AI coming out like. We can't even keep it up with it locally. How a college, by the time they institute their AI department, it'll be years. Yeah, my so, teacher, he said, don't ever. Like, he told us that AI could write our paper. He said, we we better not use it. But I'm about to use it for you guys. No, it's, it it's, it it's amazing. Yeah, Listen, so. it's you got to understand, like, AI's got some serious risk for our society. But as of right now, if you don't use it, you're going to be left behind because – it's like putting a thousand brains to work with you with a click of a button. Exactly. That, that's how was, powerful it is. It's so much smarter than any movie. professor. It's yeah. absolutely insane. And guys, it's here's the crazy point. part. I, I just saw a study. So like AI right now is like the size of the fingertip of my, my little pinky finger. 
Yeah. They say in one year, it's going to be like this. They did a graphical representation. That's how big it's going to be. I remember we're just in the infancy stages. It's absolutely nuts. By the way, you'll never know who you're talking to on the phone going forward. Like in a year, you're not even gonna, you're not going to know with a, a company, and then eventually it's going to wind up with your friends and stuff. It's going to be scary, man. Like guys, yeah, crazy. guys, gals, man. Like find <laughs> find a significant other now because it's just about to get crazy. Can you imagine if you're talking to AI and you're trying to date someone, you find out it's not even that person? That takes yeah. catfishing to a whole new level, doesn't it? Exactly. It's gonna yeah. be crazy, man. So just uh, so here's my advice to anyone college, so I'm clear on it. Mm -hmm. If you're going to do college, because a lot of you guys get pressure from your parents, I get it. But understanding at the end of your four years in college, you will not be any wiser to the business world. It's just the truth. You're going to get a degree. They're going to make you feel good about it. So use that four years to get ahead in your life and treat college just like regular education. It's just like K through 12. Now it's K through 16. Just get through it. Get it done. And if you're halfway through it, you're like, I don't want to go. My parents, I go, just rip through it and get, get the band-aid ripped off, man. And just put it away, and then you never have a bridge. But getting your master's and your doctorate, unless you want to do some sort of teaching or it's required, yeah. why would you ever get a master's in business? For what? Unless you plan on becoming a professor, don't do it. There's yeah. no benefit to it. Yeah. That's like, hey, Rick, I want to pay you ten grand to learn wholesaling, but I'm never going to do anything with it. That's what most people do. Yeah. Okay, yeah. that's fine. Right. So... Okay, bud. Get it. Let me know how it works out, man. Get that deal. Right, yeah. Thank you. Okay, man. So, Ryan, what's going on, man? What's going on, Rick? So let me Sporting the you... American flags back there, man. You look cold, man. It is cold. I know you're feeling it, too. I'm over I, here. I, I, I just made out. Like, my brain stops working when it gets too cold. I don't know. Yeah. Like, it's like Florida, man. We're just uh, – our <clears throat> my it's, place here it's... is not meant for the cold. Yeah. I can't ever – Boy, it's it's just as battery time, but uh, <laughs> yeah. All right, let me let me explain to you what happened today because I had shoot. Let's appointment. go. Yeah, I had my first appointment today with a seller, and so that, it actually all happened kind of in one day. So I had called her earlier around like one, you know, built MCTP uh -huh. over the phone, built solid report, and so I was like, all right, you know, I'd love to walk through the property, get a better idea of it. So I actually went over there an hour later. And it went good, man. Like I was doing good. I was like, you know, and so I got to the very end of it, um, you know, conditioned her. She was ready to make a decision. Mm -hmm. And so we agreed on a number and I knew it was something that was very, you know, it was feasible. It was you know, going to be something that I could work with for sure. And so I was basically just like, you know, if this is something I could, get written up today would you be cool if you know we could maybe get this get the ball rolling mm -hmm. and she was like yeah but i want to run this by my real estate friend and i'm like oh god okay. yeah and obviously i'm not just going to be like no like you can't you can't like we got to either do this now like i don't want to this just would seem shady and so i was like you know i understand you know and so she calls him up and i'm assuming he's a realtor and you know he gets on the phone and dude, this man just starts interrogating me. He's like, you know, oh, what are the terms of your contract? Blah, blah blah. And I'm this is this is where he started going crazy. Is when he heard that I want a 30 day inspection, he was like, Oh, yeah. you won't need that. He was like, That's unrealistic. He was like, basically, you know, and this is so I'm on the phone, he's on speaker, seller's right next to me. He was like, oh, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go in, in, into a contract. You know, I, I, I just wouldn't do that. And the seller's literally like, oh, yeah, you know, whatever you think is is good, you know. And I'm just like, oh, my gosh. You know, obviously, it's they know each other. They're friends. So they're like, you know. So and how did it how did it end? So this is how it ended. So he was like, you know, send me over your contract so I can review it. So I emailed mm -hmm. it to him an hour ago. I don't, I haven't checked my email yet, but I, he got it. So he's basically just like, you know, he's going to go over it and then he's going to review it. And then he's going to talk to the seller and basically be, you know, the seller will get back to me, you know, as far as, you know, mm -hmm. she wants to move forward with me or not. But I was so like, just, 
Did you submit an offer? I did. So uh, let me ask you this. So was your seller, uh, was it a guy or a gal? It was a gal. She was older. And she was talking to a guy. Do you know what the relationship between the person she contacted is? I think they're just good friends. And how did you wind really up getting on the phone with them? So it was, uh, it was a drive for dollars lead and called her up. She answered. And, you know, are you the owner of blah, 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 you want to sell? Yes. I was like, okay, cool. You know, I'd actually be interested in buying the property. Yeah. And so that's when, you know, I built MCTP. Her husband yeah. passed away. Um, it's a decent sized home. So she's, she's looking to downsize. Uh -huh. um, it, it's dated. It needs updates, maybe some AC work. And so we kind of discussed price on the phone. I was like, you know, so you, you were on the phone with her. You weren't with her physically, right? Yes. But then I went over to the property like an hour later. And that's when you got on the phone with her friend. Yeah. So at the end of the in-person appointment, mm -hmm. she was like, okay, let me call up my real estate friend, whatever. And I was like, okay. And then she, uh, he answered. And then she was like, oh, do you want to talk to, to the buyer? He's here. I'm like, sure. I'm like, yeah. So your good news, bad news is listen, you're, you're never going to know it all in the, in the beginning. So like, just do it. Like sometimes you just have to do it. Um, there's a better way to handle this. And I want to train you right now. And then I'll, I'll show everybody else who's listening when it comes up. Because the last thing you ever want to do, especially on the first physical meeting, is get on like a three-way phone call with a stranger. It's, yeah. it's, it's, by the way, it will never go well. Yeah, I feel like so I was the first, the first rule is you have to understand is who is this person? Is it her lawyer? Is it a realtor friend? Is it a brother? Is it a sister? You've got to know the relationship because it's it, it's key. Because if you don't know the relationship, you have no idea what you're walking into. And in any sales situation, you never you try to avoid the unknown at all cost. So when you do that, go, hey, let me get their information. You don't talk badly about them. You, you're just trying to find out what am I going to be dealing with? What, what are going to be the challenges? So if you know they're a lawyer, they're going to eat the paperwork up. If you know if it's a realtor, they're going to eat the price up. And if you know it's a family member, they think everyone's screwing them outside of the family. So yeah. knowing what you're up against is half the battle. So you going in with no information, dude, you got guts. Cause I would like, I don't like it's, you don't know that low. So it's fine. You're, you're kind of going them blindly courageous, but um, you'll know in the future. So in the future, know who it is. Number two, don't do that phone call. And here's the reason is um, what you want to do before she switches, she seemed to like really like you. Did she like the price you were offering? Yeah, she, we had agreed on the price. And then she was like, oh, oh. yeah. So she here's what I do. Okay. Here's what I do. So and I, I do this and in, in most of my objections are realtors and attorneys. So she's like, oh, I want my realtor to look it over. Now, when they say it or my lawyer to look it over, Okay, I, I know what to look for, right? Are they going to go after price or are they going to go after terms? Rarely do they go after both. So once you know that, I say, listen, hey, whatever her name is, uh, Julie or whatever. Hey, Julie, that's great. Let me just review some things that we've talked about, make sure we're good. And just go over and just anchor her on the price. So what was the number you guys agreed on? 445. Okay. So if you're comfortable with that number and she's comfortable with that number, keep anchoring that number. So when her third party friend kind of say, you're getting screwed on that number, I'm like, but Judy, we talked about this earlier. You were a hundred percent fine with it. Yeah. She's like, yeah, you're right. Why do I? So it's like, so I set lawyers up perfectly. I anchor the seller on the price. And then when I give it to the attorney, I usually have to email it to him. When they go to try to change the price, I said, um, he'll say, Hey Judy, um, I have some problems with this contract. You know, we need to talk about it. And she goes, I don't like the offer he's given you. I said, well, Judy, remember we talked about the offer. You said you were fine with it. We've gone over it probably four or five times. Why would you talking to your lawyer change that price number? And if you, if you guys will just anchor in price over the third party, you'll get so, because they won't, they're like, yeah, yeah, I made that decision. That's my price. I'm like, sure. You said you're hundred percent comfortable with that price. I just want to make sure. Yeah. Okay. I just, yeah, perfect. Once you anchor them the price, then all you have to do is overcome the terms. So he's going to go, I don't like the 30 day. I'm like, <clears throat> okay, well, I need time to get in and take a look at it. Is the property vacant? No. 
So she's a, she's then you got to decide, okay, well, if I give on the terms, you know, it's still like, can't get this done. But when they attack everything, it's like, where do I start? Like, where can I go from there? So next time they try to interject that third person, which is usually a realtor, or a lawyer, understanding what's going to go after price and what's going to go after terms. Family members just going to attack you most likely because you're an outsider. Yeah. And so you say, Judy, listen, I just want to go over. Are you comfortable with the terms we've agreed upon? Do you see anything that would change this? And then I make sure I anchor them on price because the one thing I cannot go up in price. If they're going to go up in price, I'm out. So now when you have that conversation is um, what I usually do is get them off the phone and um, you can have the conversation one-on-one -on -one with them. That way you can't be held like accountable for everything you say. Yeah, because she was just sitting there the whole time. Oh, you know, if, if he says it, I'm cool with it. She, yeah. She was just going with whatever he was saying, and he was just really not liking that 30-day inspection. He was basically just like, oh. You know why? That's because it, it just, long. it just, it, well, number one, it's his opinion. And number two, it puts him a power situation. And there's not much you can overcome with it. So you got to yeah. be like, listen, Julius, listen, I value your, your family members, friends, stuff. I wouldn't give up. You're still in good shape, but. I think you were pretty comfortable with the price and the terms. The reason I'm doing that is because I got to make sure I got to look at everything and I want to make sure I can move forward with this. So if I go in and tell you it's 10 days, I need more time. I'd rather just be honest and upfront and tell you. Yeah. And she's like, you know what? Yeah, that's right. I do respect you for doing that. And you got to keep going with the reasons. So what you do is make a list of all the crap he came up with, which is mostly going to be BS and just work your way through it. Because number one, he, I, I say, hey, listen, is your friend a licensed realtor? Oh, he's not? Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I look through the website and all. Like, I'm yeah. pretty sure he's definitely like licensed and whatnot. So just kind of go backwards. But when it, guys, whenever it comes up to a third party, like, do not take that phone call right there because it, it just identify who they are and then anchor the price with your seller. Because when the price comes up, and she's like, you know, we, I already agreed to the price. Once she says she's agreed to the price, there's nothing the guy or the gal on the other line can do or say. Because they're like, oh, crap, they already made up their mind. Yeah, I was trying to figure out a way to kind of like get that through her head. Like, look, if we no, agree you, on you the can't, number. So you can't, so when they're on the phone, you can't challenge anything he says. Because he, he has the relationship with her and there's nothing yeah. you can do. So you can respect it. And at the end of the conversation, when it goes horribly bad like that, I just say, listen, I really respect your opinion. And I appreciate it. Let me talk to Judy and let's see if we can make some changes to make this work. And you're going to have to give the guy one freaking thing, dude. Find out what it is. Give it to him. And just try to say, listen, Judy, I thought we talked about price. You said you were okay with it. And that's how I would say it to her. So go with price and work your way backwards and figure out the one thing you can give the guy. My favorite is lawyers. They want to change like language in the contract. I don't give a crap. Instead of he or they or us or, uh, you know, be quit it or whatever. I don't give a yeah. crap. If I can still buy, you want to change language, you win. Like you get your language change, get them to stick to their price and you can do amazing things in real estate. So I would call her back and just re-anchor on the price and then just try to find one thing he wants to give and just go, listen, I'm going to do this only to make him happy. And if it makes you comfortable, that's fine. But here's the reason is you have to buy the property, not uncle Louie, right? Mm -hmm. And if Uncle Louie was such a savior, he would have already wrote you a check and been done with it. So I do appreciate his advice and I respect it. But we've agreed on price. I've told you why I want to do the 30 days. Find one thing to give him and see if you can close her on that. And that's how I would do it. But try to avoid that third party phone call because you're just going to get. Like, yeah, I'm you will be running under the bus every time when you do those guys. And if you have to do it, do the phone call separately. So number one, your client doesn't hear what happens. And if the guy wants to start screaming at you, you just like, oh, I listen, I listen. He had some. And so when someone calls me out and cusses me out, which is usually what they do, I go, he had some good points to make. <laughs> That's all I say. <laughs> just like that, because I'm like, um, he's not an expert. He's not a real estate agent. And if yeah. he was so good, he'd just buy the house himself. And sometimes I go like this. I go, Judy, I'm confused. Am I buying it or is uncle Louie buying it? So yeah. my favorite objection is I always get, the neighbor wants to buy the house. It's called FOMO, fear of missing out. I'm like, well, that's interesting. They have a house with a mortgage. So they're magically going to come up with $250,000 cash to buy your house. Yeah. I've never seen that happen before, but let's give it a shot. 
If he can yeah. give you a uh, proof of funds with the cash statement, I will support this 100%. Nobody to this date has ever bought a house from the neighbor. Yeah. I usually have to pay a little bit more and negotiate, but like, I don't care. So yeah, the good thing is you just kept moving forward in spite of, and that's why I'm telling you guys, that's how wholesaling works. You don't know every answer and you get like these weird things. Like I wouldn't have known when I started my first year, same thing. I would have probably done the same thing you did. You tried to overcome them and close them. Those are impossible odds to overcome. So what you want to do is call them on like another line. You just filter what they say and say, listen, uh, Uncle Johnny had some good points, but yeah. I think we've agreed on the price. He would like to go from a 30 day inspection to like a 21. I can probably do that if we can agree to a contract today. And that's how I do it. Just go back there and do it that way. You'll be fine. Yeah. I just, I don't know how I could have avoided. No, nah, I just don't, don't do the phone call. Cause it, so yeah, that's what I'm saying. Hang up with her and usually wait three or four hours. Because when she calls them, they get all jacked and charged. They're like, okay, I'm going to give it to Ryan. He thinks he's penetrating our family. I'm going to show him who's boss. Yeah. And then you just got to keep your cool when they start screaming at you. And just like, because if you start screaming and cursing back to him, you guarantee you're not going to get a deal. Yeah. Because, I mean, she basically just called him. Uh, and he answered. And I'm just like, oh, shoot. Like, I got to deal uh, with this now. You want to hear a funny story? When I was younger, um, I got a really good deal on a property once. And it was an older lady and I begged, I begged her family to help out, begged them. She had like eight kids, not one, no, 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 no. I had to help her with an estate sale. I mean, I got the lady, know this lady really well. This is back yeah. when I did everything myself. The day of closing, 12 people showed up screaming at you piece of crap. This is the flip with Rick guy. I go, listen, I'm a hundred percent transparent what I do. Yeah. I felt, ah, and I just looked, I finally looked at him. I go, just like this. I go, they go, I can't believe you're doing this. I go, fine. I'm out. <laughs> I, I, I like, I don't need this. I want to help. She wants to sell the house. And at the end of the day, like, no, we really need you to buy the house because we need the money to do this, this and that. I'm like, oh, so now you need me. Yeah. I mean, call me every name in the book. And I got to tell you, it's powerful as a wholesaler to be able to look someone in the eyes and go, you know what? I'll back out. Yeah. I, I knew they loaded a truck and I'm like, how are you going to do this? And the best part is <clears throat> the lady was like 74 years old. They were moving her to from Florida to Texas to take care of um, the uh, her daughter's kid that um, has special needs. Yeah. And you know what? They you know why they really needed her ready for this. They needed her to drive the 18 wheel truck. I'm just like. You just told me she's blind and half deaf, although she just drove you to Dunkin' Donuts with all six of you guys in the car. And so it's like just understanding you will never win against the family argument. And I just sat there. I screamed at the lady like a title company. I had a good relationship. She's like she came in and she started screaming at him. She goes, listen, this guy's the most reputable guy, honestly. And she looked at me. And she goes, tell him you're going to walk away. I go, are you nuts? I go, I'm not walking away. She goes, tell them it's going to work. I'm like, and I, I just took my faith. I go, listen, obviously I tried to reach out with you guys over the last two months. Nobody returned any of my emails, phone calls, nothing. And yeah. here we are in closing day. And now you have a problem Yeah. and you're telling me I'm a piece of garbage, all this stuff. I tell you what, I'll back out. I'll make yeah. it easy for you. You guys can do what you want with the house. Yeah. And they came back and I walked out. I went out to my car. I was like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm doing this. And they came back and the title lady knocked on there. She goes, they really need you to close. And then I went and I go, tell me why you want me to buy your mom's house now. And it's like, yeah. uh, and the lady, boy, she said some choice words after my closing. I go, you know, that's really interesting coming from someone that just begged me to come back in the office to close. Yeah. I mean, what changed? Like, I go, I go, Pam, I reached out to you seven times and you told me to lose your phone number. And your mother told me, that you guys would do this. And I didn't believe it. And like, you, you got to understand guys, all families have dynamics that you don't understand. And if you try to figure them out, you'll drive yourself crazy. So always take the high road when it comes to a seller's family, because you have no idea. I think my family's crazy. I don't know about you. Like we all think we only have the only family that's crazy. We all do. Everybody's crazy out there. It's like, what level can people like hold their stuff together? That's what you do. So when it comes to wholesaling, these families get emotionally charged. When they start attacking, you just kind of take it back and go. 
And I, I didn't know you felt that way. And sometimes, as long as it's not coming from your seller, you got a great shot. So I walked away from a deal and I was told to do it. So to make sure I didn't get sued or anything else crazy. And then um, they took uh, two and a half hours to do the closing because they decided they were going to pick through every document. I go, um, I signed my side at the title company. She goes, two and a half hours. They made me go through every line by line. I'm on a cash sale. So yeah. you did the right thing, Lowe. So I do, do kudos on like sticking in there. But like yeah. on the third phone call, just kind of like pull back and call them separately. And that way you control the tone of it. And then you call back your seller. I go, listen, I talked to your brother. Very interesting guy. And then she'll usually know you're like, he's just trying to protect me. I, yeah. I go, I get it. So the more intel you can get from your seller on the family member that's vetting you, the better off you're going to do. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. going in cold, you're just like, oh my god, like. Yeah, she was just dying for his input. Like she's like, I'm no matter. I could have given her a dollar for the home. I feel like, and she would have been like, oh, let me see what Mel has to say. And I'm like, talk to her. At the end of the day, I think like he he knows probably what I want to do with it. Yeah, and just give him that. give him one thing. That's all you got to do. Find the, the cheapest thing you can give him on that contract and give him the respect. And then maybe even um, you could tell her if he wants to come to the closing, he can come there. But you're going to get everything set up in advance so you don't have to deal with him. I, by the way, I, it happens all the time. Like so-and-so showed up for the closing. They expected this big pomp and circumstance. I'm like, no, no, no. We, <clears throat> the last thing, I do not negotiate at the closing table. It's the last piece. And I never, ever, ever let it happen. So- I would go back to her. When did you have that conversation? Was that today? Yeah, this all happened today. I do it tomorrow and just kind of go, hey, just let that ship simmer. And hopefully he never calls you and she asks him one or two more questions and you can move forward. It's just, it's a progression. She feels like she's too nice and she probably has someone to protect her. Yeah. Go, Listen, I'm going to give you a fair deal, but like, here's the deal. It's my money and this is what I can do. And you can't do stuff just to make other family members happy. You can do you can make exceptions, but you can't just change the deal. If she won't change the price and you you know the price works, then find a way to go forward with it. Yeah. Let me know if you want a JV on it. Like I'll figure a way to do it with you if it makes sense. So Yeah, I'll, I'll see. You know, I'm going to give her a call tomorrow. See, I, I'm assuming he's going to call her and be like, oh, you know, he wants to sign the contract. He's probably not going to be able to close, blah, blah, blah. When in reality, it's like I, I will close on it. If yeah, I have to go back and get a reduction, it is what it is. But I think yeah. he's just – I don't know what, what's – he just like, listen, there's a lot of, there's a lot of negative people. So you could probably look the guy up and figure out like what his tone is just off of his social media. That's the beauty of social media. Mm -hmm. Like, honestly, I can go on social, someone's social media account. I can tell you right away if they're a negative person, it's too easy. It's like when yeah. people are negative, everything around them is negative. It's terrible. Life sucks. I don't want to do this. And positive people do the opposite. They just want to be around people that energize them and keep them up. And I'm fine with that too. So do a little research, but tomorrow you got to reach out to her and follow up with it and give the guy one thing and just move forward. And she, sometimes she'll go like this. She goes, you know, he, he's a little crazy sometimes. He's just trying to protect me. And go, listen, I get it. He's trying to protect you. you go, listen, I'm going to treat you just like as I would my mother. And I love my mother. But like you want to sell, I want to buy. We have to create a win-win situation. I got to get something that works for me. I want to get something that works for you. So I'm being upfront with you and transparent. If that makes me guilty, then I'm guilty. So like your brother was right on that part and just move forward. Yeah. And when he comes up, don't talk negatively about him and just keep moving forward. So this goes back to the beginning of my conversation when I said what not to do, do not talk negatively about him. It won't work. Yeah. I was, I was holding my breath, man. I was yeah. Like, as bad as you want to do it, I'm like, Oh, I just want to punch this guy's yeah. lights out. You know, it's yeah. like, <laughs> but you can't go, you can't go MMA on him. It just doesn't work. So I dude. That's powerful because a lot of people would have clammed up and go, oh, I don't even know what to do. Like a lot of people just quit when a guy starts yelling at you on the other line. Just like, but just go. Yeah. So if you ever get caught in that situation and go, oh, okay, well, these are all things to consider and get off the phone and then read back, go back to your seller and treat that person like they're in the rear of your mirror. And hopefully you don't have to do that phone call again. Cause if you have to call them every time, it'll be painful, but hopefully she's, yeah. I mean, I'll eventually I'm, tell you like, ah, I never really liked him, but like he always yeah. does try to protect me. I'm like, okay, I might as well have been on the MLS talking to yeah. my realtor and she, so here, here's how you can set him up. Go listen. If you want, he can come to the closing. Nothing happens at the closing. It's a setup. I don't <laughs> yeah, show yeah. Up to the closing. I'm not going to be there because they come to the closing looking to fight. 
Yeah. Like, yeah I, they come in and like every time we go to the closing, I'm like, <laughs> I yeah. wish I had a two-way beer. I'm like, I don't go to the closing. So <laughs> yeah. I set them up on purpose. Like, go to the closing. I think they're going to protect you. Like, go for it. The deal's already yeah. done before the closing. Yeah. Tell them to go to the closing. That way you can protect her. Uh-huh. So let me know how it works out, man. You got it. All right. Okay, sure. man. All right. Okay, see you. Love this stuff, man. So, guys, whenever you get that person <laughs> that wants to, like, challenge you, especially on the phone, you just kind of, like, don't attack them. And just go, yeah, that's interesting. Don't even say, I'm sorry you feel that way because it's insulting. And then just regroup back to your seller and go, listen, you know, we were okay on the price, right? So once you anchor the price and the person tells you to change the price, it's too overcoming one. If you do it the other way, it's too overcoming you and you're, it's not going to win. So once you anchor your sell on that price, you can easily overcome that ob objection. So, um, dude, kudos, kudos for Ryan going out there doing a lot of people like freeze up on it. So guys, a remember a lot of times in the whole thing, we just have to move forward in spite of not knowing everything and you'll make mistakes, but that's how you make money while you learn. Don't wait and try to study this business two to four years. Like college teaches you. It doesn't work that way. So, your failures are what actually make you a success in wholesaling, and you have to remember it. So, guys, please make sure you are subscribed to this channel. I got some really cool stuff dropping this week, and Zach will be on tomorrow on Flip with Rick, and then I'll be back on Thursday and Friday. We could do the one-on-one -on -one lives. Make sure you subscribe to Rick Ginn. Make sure you hit that like button. And, guys, check out my son on ZachGinn.com. And uh, I appreciate you guys. Go out there and get deals. And uh, we'll see you five more times this week, guys.